Hello and welcome back to ABC Angie's Book Club. I'm very, very excited about all of the books that I feature in the book club. This one has got a bit more passion in it and I'm going to explain exactly why. It's called The Sex Lives of African Women and it's a great read. It's a great listen if you wanted to listen to it on audiobook and I'm so so pleased joining me today is the writer it is the wonderful Nana Dakoa Sechiama have I said that correctly you've said that brilliantly thank you so much Angie and it's a delight to be here it's good to have you here Nana now let's get straight down to business this book is not for the faint-hearted and it's what I would call a generational book if I were to give this book to my mother I think she would be mortified but I'm going to give this book to my daughter to read because I think it's very, very important to talk about your body's sexual health, etc. So let's talk about some of these women. First of all, I'd like to know how and where you found these women, because there are some very open. Some people might find some of these stories quite delicate. Where did you find these women, Nana? I really found these women all over the world pre-pandemic. Well, we're still in a pandemic. Well, yeah. I used to travel quite a lot for my job. And so once I decided to do this book, everywhere I would go to, I would try and just find a woman to interview. So, for instance, when I was in Sao Tome on holiday, which is an island where they only speak Portuguese, I said to my tour guide, you know, who spoke brilliant English, do you know any Sao Tomean women I could interview? I had friends who knew I was writing the book. And one friend, for instance, she said, oh, my neighbor is a dominatrix and sex worker. I think you should interview her for your book. You know, I met Nura when I was in Senegal on holiday and a friend said to me, I have a friend who's moved here from Kenya and she needs sister friends. Can you go and visit her? So what if I just met somebody and I thought, hmm, they look like they could have an interesting story. I would just say to them, I'm writing a book about the sex lives of African women. Can I interview you? And invariably they would say yes. Some of the women have chosen to change their names, though, haven't they? Absolutely. And I completely understand that as someone who's been blogging about sex and sexuality, yeah. you know, since 2009, there's still a lot of stigma about women who choose to speak about sex openly. Your blog, and this, this wasn't something I was going to touch on, but as you've mentioned it, your blog is quite explicit. Your blog is very, very open. When you first launched that blog, was it met with a bit of opposition? I was expecting a position, but to be honest, I didn't get that, right? I rather got a lot of affirmation, mm -hmm. lots of women saying, I'm so grateful for this space, lots of younger women in particular saying, you know, this is a space I can come and have conversations that I can't have with my mom, with my auntie. I had married couples say to me, this is the blog that helped us have conversations about how mm -hmm. we will have sex, right? Um, so it's actually been really positive. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, when I first saw the title, in my mind, I had two types of women in my head. That shows you how closed off I was, Nana. I had the westernized African woman and I had, and I hope this doesn't come across as me criticizing, the more rural African woman. Does that make sense? It does. And I feel like that's because whenever African women's sexuality is spoken about, usually, it's done with a sort of anthropological lens, yeah. right? Where you've usually got the Western outsider studying the strange specimen. But here, it was really me in conversations with other women, many of whom are women just like myself and yeah. you, Angie. Yes. And I loved as well that you had African women who were mixed. So you might have a Nigerian woman whose one parent was Nigerian, the other parent was Scottish. So you, you had mixed race African women. And what I really felt about some of the stories, which we're going to delve into in a moment, was the African culture isn't just assigned to Africa. <laughs> so, you, you know, these women took their cultural experiences in the bedroom, in the emotions, to wherever they were. I think there was a lady from uh, Zambia who lived in the United States. There was a lady from Côte d'Ivoire. Her story, I mean, there were some amazing stories. I don't want to give too much away. So could we touch on about three? Because I'd like to get the kind of backbone behind them. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's take, I'm going to call her Selma. 
because I'm assuming that even if her name isn't Selma, or if, if, if it is, she's agreed to be called that in the book. Yes, yeah, Selma, that's actually her real name and she was oh. happy to be known as herself in the book. Okay, so Selma didn't want to have sex until she was married. She didn't want to have penetrative sex until she was married. And she was very, very open saying that her and her boyfriend did all manner of things sexually. They just did not have penetrative sex. Selma then went abroad without her boyfriend and had an experience. And what really struck me was because she said he didn't come, so it wasn't really rape. And that just made me wonder about the stories that had been taught to her about sex, the platform that she'd learnt about sex, but also what kind of upset me with Selma's story was the guilt. She'd done nothing wrong, but it's that whole guilt trip. And is that something that you find African women automatically had implanted in them? There's a guilt thing when it came to talking about sex and your body. I think that's the problem when, you know, many of us grew up without any form of positive education around sex. When we are made to think sex is something bad, something terrible, and you're not supposed to do it, right? So lots of people, the stories they shared with me, they felt bad, they felt guilty when they had been abused, even if they were abused as children, because somehow they felt they had been complicit in an act of wrongdoing. Um, and yes, so I feel like that was pretty consistent across the board. And I suspect that women all over the world, you yeah. know, can probably resonate with that. Do you think that being of African origin, there is a different teaching to European origin? I don't want to talk about the church just yet, but I do think it's something that we should touch on. I mean, I feel like absolutely your culture, your context, you know, influences how you're raised, what you're told. And I know you said you don't want to talk about religion yet, but that was really a huge factor in a lot of people's upbringing, right? A, a Christian upbringing, which in many ways demonized, you know, sex outside of particular parameters um, and actually resulted in people feeling guilty even when the sexual act had not been one of their choice, had been consensual, had frankly been for abuse. Mm. It's kind of it's difficult to acknowledge it's difficult to be very open about how sometimes the teaching of sex it comes under a, a dark umbrella whereby it's meant to be something that's supposed to be enjoyed embraced exactly. even if you choose to, to you know perform a sexual act on yourself it's almost as though we must do this behind closed doors we mustn't tell anybody that we're doing this how do we knock down some of these teachings? How do we unteach ourselves? How do we knock down these barriers, Nana? It's a great question. And for me, I feel like many of the women that I featured in the book show us some of how to do that, right? Yeah. There's a lot of unlearning that we have to do. There's mm -hmm. a lot of relearning we have to do, a lot mm -hmm. of love we have to show to ourselves. We have to allow ourselves the ability to go on a journey of self-discovery. So yeah. that's one of the themes in my book, right? And I felt like many of the women in that section show how sometimes you just have to give yourself space and time to figure things out, to have experiences, to try new things. I think in almost every area of our life, we acknowledge that you get better when you practice, but somehow yes. when it comes to sex, we don't think you should be practicing I sex. I love that. Oh, in, in getting better when you practice, you, pro you, you have to do it more and more. Exactly, but especially been, with yourself. Right, but if you've been taught that it's dirty, so I'm gonna bring in one of the ladies that I've kind of felt for, Maureen. I think mm. she was in her late 20s, early 30s. Now, she'd had a lot of lovers, mm -hmm. but wasn't very successful, or at the time of the book, hadn't been successful in maintaining a relationship. I believe her longest relationship was about eight weeks. So she mm -hmm. was battling with confidence. She was battling with self-image. So in the case of Maureen, practicing and practicing, but she's left feeling not good about herself. You know, there's a big battle here, isn't there? Absolutely. But that's why I personally feel like the best form of practice when it comes to sex is solo pleasure, really. It's, it's learning to fall in love with yourself, learning to know your body, learning to figure out what feels good to you so that you're not going to outside sources for that kind of validation.
I like that. But we're talking now masturbation. Absolutely. Okay. Um, masturbation, it's the word. I actually said it. It was probably, <laughs> no, it was the word years ago that you would, you'd whisper. Masturbation, yes. the sex industry, sex toys, sexual health. These yes. are things now that I think, especially like my daughter's generation, and even I'm more open to discussing these things because if you keep it behind a closed door, it doesn't, it, you know, how can you flourish in that area? And I love where you say, you know, getting to know your body surely you must get to know your own body before you give it to somebody else mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and you know i feel like it's still an ongoing journey for a lot of us right to do away with the shame associated with masturbation many people as children were told don't touch yourself don't yeah. open your legs don't sit with your legs or jar anything that gave you sort of self-pleasure was seen as a bad thing. And so that's also still like a bridge that a lot of women need to, in a sense, cross. Mm. Um, but I feel like it's the safest, healthiest form of sex. Yeah. I, I want to touch on Nora. Nora struck me. She was, I think, quite early on in the book. She met her husband on a dating app, I believe. Yes. She was from Kenya. Her husband was from Senegal, or she lives yes. in Senegal. And her husband has a number of wives. Yes. She was quite open when she said when they first met, because did they not marry uh, yes. early on in their relationship? Yes. So they met on a Muslim dating app. You know, you're right. She was from Kenya. He was from Senegal. And he wanted to come over and visit her. And she basically said, I don't want us to meet unless we're husband and wife. So they got yeah. married online by an imam. And in her own words, we met and all we did that weekend was pray and fuck. Yes. Um, but, then, <laughs> but then the a shift came when she eventually went to Senegal. Don't want to give too much away. Mm. But this was a major shift when mm -hmm. she got to realise that she wasn't his only wife. I mean, she knew before she went to Senegal, she wasn't but, his only wife. Yeah. But in, in going to Senegal and in being in the midst of these women, mm -hmm. she's very open near the end of the chapter where she talks about preparing herself for yes. him, doing yes. rituals for him, getting yes. her body essenced for him. Yes. So in on one hand, it didn't seem as though she had a problem in mm -hmm. being one of many wives. And she had mm -hmm. her, sh her chosen times to mm -hmm. have sex with him. Another African woman might have found that a little bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And for me, right, sort of the real lesson is I really don't think we should privilege one type of relationship structure over another. I don't think we should privilege monogamy over polygamy over polyamory. I think there are many valid forms of relationship structures. What is important is people are actually able to have a real choice and real agency in figuring out what works for them. And yeah. It's a, a, a statement comes to my mind, which is one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for some reason, when it comes to sex, there is a hope depending on the culture that you're from, that you will be your partner's one and only. That isn't always the case, as we saw with Nora, and she was quite open and quite happy about that. How do we, once again, knock down these barriers, knock down these thought processes? So I will be honest, when I first read about Nora, I was like, oh my gosh, but that's because of how I was brought up. Do you see what I mean? It, I it, do. It, it doesn't always fit for everyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's the thing, right? People have to figure out what fits for them. You know, I think what I don't want necessarily personally is for people to feel corralled that, you know, monogamy is the way, the truth and the, and the light. And that's the only option because a lot of people have found that doesn't work for them, which is why I think in this day and age, there's a lot more interest and openness and curiosity around other forms of relationship structures like polyamory. Hmm. 
and you're very, very open. It's a very, very open read. Um, we talk about um, lesbians. There are women in there that have found themselves happier in a same-sex relationship, bisexual, pansexual. There's even a lady who was fighting with her emotions because she had a disability, but wanted to enjoy a great sex life. Yes. And, you know, like for me as well, that was one of the, in a sense, things I got out of the book, right? I found that many of my own myths and misconceptions were challenged. You know, so you mentioned Elizabeth, who, yes, is a woman who uses a wheelchair. And yes. one of the things that, that she would talk about was having to figure out when she met people online, you know, when should I tell you I use a wheelchair? And it made me question myself and say, how come I have never dated anybody with a visible disability as well, right? So I think that's one of the things that the book does for people. It helps them to reflect on what may seem like just preferences, but I think sometimes yeah. we need to question where our preferences come from. Have any of your thought processes changed on sex since the book, if I can ask you that? Yes, you can, absolutely. And I think this example I gave is just like one instance of that, right? Um, and for me as well, it's actually the importance of giving myself space to heal. I think I'm one of those people who compartmentalizes a lot, you know, and in speaking to so many women about their healing journeys, I, I thought to myself, oh, wow, this is something that you've never really dug into, like my own experiences of being sexually abused as a child. And, you know, how do you actually unpack that without being traumatized and re-traumatized? Um, and also, how do you challenge yourself to, to continue on a journey of self-discovery without without settling. Yeah. And feeling self-worth, especially if sexual abuse has been a part of your journey. Mm -hmm. That feeling of self-worth is probably battered, if that makes sense. You, you compromise how you feel. You've mentioned the word healing. Now, there are, were two chapters that really struck me, freedom and healing. And the freedom chapter comes first, and then the healing chapter's a little bit down the line in the book, whereas I personally, once again, because of my upbringing, I would have put healing first in order that I can express and enjoy freedom. Why did you put freedom first? I'm really interested in this. <laughs> there were a couple of reasons, right? Um, I found the stories in Freedom to be truly inspirational. They felt to me like pointing the way to models of different ways of being, right? And different ways of, in a sense, self-actualizing. Um, and so I wanted people to come to those stories initially and feel a sense of hope and, you know, excitement and joy. Yes. And some of the healing stories were really, really tough. And I didn't want people to start the book feeling sad or depressed. Okay. Yeah, and I felt like if they had read about freedom first, you know, and they came to healing, it would be like, okay, yes, we now recognize that healing is also part of the journey and yeah. not feel kind of stuck in there. Okay, I can get that. I can get that. Because if you're healing from something, you're probably coming from a place of pain. Do you want to be reading about a place of pain when the subject matter is about sex? And we're looking at so many different women who have found freedom because Absolutely. they have acknowledged who they are, what they want, and have managed to unpack a lot of the teachings and reteach themselves. Um, one other thing that I really, really do want to touch on is, and this is something that just came amongst a group of my friends. We're in our mid fifties. We're in a place where some of us are single and are kind of enjoying being single because we want to explore who we are. We want to explore what we want first and then decide, you know, what kind of sexual relationship do I want? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have found when we talk is that sex starts in the mind you see someone and straight away you think, oh, he looks nice, oh, she looks nice, but you actually don't even know if they are nice. You have to get to know them. But yet, sex seems to be very, very high on the agenda. Can we fall in love with the sex before the person? <laughs> That's a really good question. I mean, I definitely feel like there was a, at least one relationship I fell into because I was stigmatized. 
I definitely fell in love with the sex and then later on the feelings for the person came. So I think it's entirely possible and it doesn't necessarily have to happen in a linear fashion, you know, where you fall in love with somebody's mind. But of course, there's some people who are, and now I can't remember the word for it, it may be demisexual, Mm -hmm. like they literally cannot have sex with somebody. I have a good friend like that, unless they have an intellectual connection with a person. Okay. Okay. It's really interesting. It's a book, as I say, I wouldn't give this to my mom. I very much am looking forward to giving this to my daughter. I think it's a great read. I know people that have listened to it as well. And I think I'm probably going to listen to it as well because I am wired for sound. The Sex Lives of African Women. There are all sorts of stories in here. And I love the openness I love the honesty and it's a very, very gripping book. Nana, thank you for writing it and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Angie. It's been a delight to be here.